I believe it's less than seven on biomes. Yep. Okay, so last thing I'm going to teach you guys in Science 10 today. All right, it's going to be a lot of me jabbering, a lot of you listening, and hopefully jotting a few things down. Now, we talked about the way I was going to ask you about biomes on the unit and final exams last week, but I'll quickly review that so you know what kind of things to be listening for. Okay. Uh, one of the ways is multiple choice question with a picture and a description. All right, so very much like what you're going to see in your notes today. All right, so there'll be a picture of that biome and a description of, you know, maybe the climate, uh, animals, plants, whatever. Okay, things that are kind of indicative of that particular biome. The other way was it's going to be combined with climatographs. All right, I give you a climatograph and I say, tell me which biome this should go with and explain your reasoning. So you need to look at, all right, well, this one's showing a really steep bell curve that's really low, temperature barely gets above zero, precipitation is, you know, very little. Uh, you know, what biome should that go with? So you have to be able to read the climatogram, you got to be able to interpret it, and then you got to remember which biome you think it should go with. Okay, everybody follow me there? That one would be a written response type of question. All right, so you will have to remember the biome names for that one. Okay, any questions there? All right, now, we don't have to necessarily, there won't be any questions or anything on the test about this, about comparing it to a cell, all right? But it's just that the energy exchanges are like a cell, just on a much bigger scale. But again, I'm not going to ask you anything about that on a test, just understand that the, the exchanges are very similar. Okay. So here are our biomes of the world and where they're generally located. Okay, we're going to start with tropical rainforest. Okay, so you can see here in the kind of deep green color, right? Obviously, much of South America. So we're looking at like Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, places like that. Okay, very much uh, tropical rainforest. And you can see that that is pretty much located right on or next to the equator. Okay, because that's where they're going to get the most direct sunlight. Okay, and things like that. Right, also going to need a lot of what? for a tropical rainforest, not just sunlight, but also rainfall. Yeah, lots and lots of it. So, okay, we got a lot of that warm temperatures, never freezes, things like that. Okay, you'll also see that oftentimes next to the tropical rainforest, you'll see this kind of brownish color, right? That's the savanna, and the savanna's a grassland. It's like a tropical prairie, if you can imagine that, okay? They get almost the same amount of rain as the tropical rainforest. They just don't get it evenly. They get what are called monsoons. Okay, the monsoon season comes and it dumps rain for like two and a half months. Okay, and then the rest of the year doesn't rain again. All right, so it's very obviously very different type of plant life that can grow under those kind of conditions. They got to be able to survive torrential downpours and flooding for two months, and then live on whatever water was there for the next ten. Okay, so you definitely aren't going to get a tropical rainforest type of thing growing there because they don't typically have the root structure or the soil okay, in order to hold that kind of moisture. Okay, so you definitely get more of a grassland and obviously that's what you see mostly in Africa. Okay, so that would be, you know, um, like the Serengeti and, and things like that where you'd see, you know, elephants and uh, lions and tigers but not bears. Okay, things like that. Everybody follow? Okay. Uh, next one we'll look at after that is desert. Okay, now there's two kinds there's really three kinds of desert. There's extreme desert, which you see here is another type of biome, okay? But there's hot desert and there's like cold desert, all right? Um, deserts do appear in North America, okay? Obviously, like Southern California and Arizona and places like that, it's very desert-like, but those are a much colder desert, okay? Uh, we also oftentimes see them, you know, in places, well, you know, they're not really diagrammed here, but it's a bit desert-like in behind the Himalayas here. Um, but deserts can occur not just in really hot areas, but also in cool areas. So you see kind of desert in this area here, desert here, all right? But obviously, this is the main desert. What desert is this? That's the Sahara, yeah, all right? So if you've ever, um, like, seen pictures of Tunisia, okay, where it's like shifting dunes of sand. If you ever watched Star Wars, it's where they filmed Tatooine. Okay? Tatooine's always filmed in Tunisia, which is just rolling sand, all right? Now, are all deserts dunes and rolling sand? No. Obviously, the deserts of Arizona and whatever are not. Okay, they're very rocky because they're much colder. All right. Um, you know, there's obviously this desert here. Okay, this one here that goes behind the uh, the Himalayan mountains here. This is the Gobi Desert. All right. Now, if I had a flashlight right here where my marker is, what would that be? A shadow. A Rain shadow, okay? That's another rain shadow desert back there. In the same way, okay, that Arizona, Utah, and Nevada are a rain shadow of the Rockies. 
Everybody got me there? Okay, so that's, you know, desert being created by blockage of precipitation, okay, by high mountains. All right. Um, extreme desert, okay, you see that almost primarily on the tops of the high mountains. Okay, so in here and in here. Okay, Greenland, obviously much of that is extreme desert because it's covered by a glacier. Okay, where else should it be that's not on this map? Antarctica, the whole continent. Okay, the whole continent of Antarctica. Okay, down here. That's obviously not its shape, but it's okay, down there. Um, that's It should be that color as well. Okay, um, now, uh, Chaparral. Okay, the other name for Chaparral is often called the Mediterranean climate. Why do you suppose that is? Where do you see that color? In the Mediterranean, almost primarily. The only other, you see a little tiny bit of it here, okay, in Southern California. And you see a tiny little bit of it on the tip of the south uh, east coast of Australia, okay, and a tiny bit here in Southern Africa. It's almost entirely around the Mediterranean. It's a very unique type of climate. It can be very, very hot in the summertime. It can also be very, very dry. Okay? And so they get uh, a lot of different types of vegetation growing there that wouldn't normally grow in that type of climate. So it's, um, yeah, it's a very unique kind of, kind of biome, so it's off by itself. Okay, temperate grasslands, okay, um, that's kind of the general name. Other names that we might have heard of, obviously, prairie, okay, and in Europe, in Asia, they call it steppe. Okay, um, but essentially, it's the same as what we live in. Okay, we live in the prairie. That's the biome that we're part of. Okay, uh, temperate deciduous forest. All right, so you can see here. Okay, obviously, most of the eastern seaboard of the United States, almost all of Europe. Okay, is is temperate deciduous forest. Then we have some over here as well. Okay, um, places. Okay, over there in kind of eastern, uh, or sorry, western Asia. What kind of trees grow there? Ones that uh, no deciduous. No deciduous doesn't mean they're the kind that lose their leaves. Deciduous lose their leaves. Conifers keep their keep their leaves. Okay, so deciduous trees are the type that lose their leaves every year. Okay, and then grow them back. All right. Obviously, that's what we've got here, right? I mean, this is you know most of central Canada would also be considered sort of that. Okay, this would be like Vermont and and um, and places like that do a lot of maple syrup and things. Okay. Um, and then after that, we've got taiga. Taiga is coniferous forest. Okay, conifers typically have needles for leaves, and they make cones, coniferous trees. All right, and so you see those often along the mountains. Okay, and obviously once you get into northern uh, Canada, okay, you've got a lot of that. So if you've ever been up like Fort McMurray Way, you start getting into the taiga when you get up to that area. Okay, lots of just kind of black spruce and things like that. Above that, you've got what's called the tundra. Okay, and if you've ever been to Alaska, okay, places like that, okay, you can get well into the tundra. It's an Arctic prairie, all right? So there's a tropical prairie, there's real prairie, and then there's Arctic prairie, okay? And the reason there's nothing but prairie there is because the soil is frozen almost all the time, and nothing big other than grass can really grow roots deep enough to support itself. Certainly a tree can't okay, grow uh, roots into frozen soil. Okay. The growing seasons are also incredibly short, so something that would need to grow leaves and flower and do all that quickly can't do it. Okay, uh, so typically it's just uh, prairie-looking stuff, and you can see for miles and miles. All right, obviously most of Siberia, okay, okay, northern Russia, all right, would also be considered tundra. Okay, and then you know over here, Russia and Canada have very similar, okay, biome-type layouts. Okay, questions on those? All right, so that's generally where you can see them. Now we're going to go over the specifics of kind of each one here. All right, so in the tropical rainforest, obviously, it's trees. It's lots and lots of them, okay? It's extremely dense. How many people have ever walked in the jungle before? Anybody? Okay. It's very different than walking through the forest here, where when you walk into the forest, you can see. All right, you can see in front of you. In the jungle, forget it. All right, you walk into the jungle, it closes up behind you, and you hope you don't get turned around or you'll never find your way out. Okay, that's why oftentimes you'll see people walking through the jungle and they carry a big machete. Okay, you guys know what a machete is? It's a big, long knife, okay, and it's used for cutting brush, and you just swing it in front of you and you cut brush down because that's the only way you'll find your way back out is to follow the path of destruction, okay, that you've made. Otherwise, the jungle literally just closes in behind you, all right? It's very, very lush, and it's very, very thick, and it's layered, all right? So this picture here, you're only really seeing the canopy 
of the rainforest, and that's the tallest trees and their leaf layer. There's sub canopies and sub layers underneath that, sometimes eight different layers of vegetation before you reach the ground. Okay, now each one obviously has to be tolerant of differing levels of light. Because even on a sunny day, if you're walking on the floor of the rainforest, it can you wouldn't know it was necessarily very sunny because the canopy blocks essentially most of the light out. It would make it feel like you were walking on a cloudy day, right? Just because that much of the light would be blocked out. Okay, so very, very thick, very, very luxuriant kind of vegetation and exceptionally tall trees, much taller than anything you would see in Canada. Okay, so general characteristics cover about 13% of the Earth's land surface, a number that is unfortunately decreasing quite steadily, okay, as the demand for space and exotic lumbers and hardwoods and things like that uh, is increasing more and more of it's being cut down, okay. Um, and they grow in areas with no distinct seasonality, right, which means they're near where? the equator, right? Because they don't the tilt of the earth doesn't make any difference for them for the amount of sunlight that they receive. Okay? High temperature, high rainfall, and high humidity dominate the climate of the tropical rainforest. Okay, you can see here typical climatogram of a tropical rainforest. The temperature virtually doesn't change. Okay. Rainfall is pretty steady with their dry season. Okay, being maybe through like May, June, July, where they only get 150 millimeters of rain in a month only okay we get that much and it floods okay well it floods there too it's flooded most of the time now difference here like you look at these pictures here and you can see that these mount that there are mountains here but what's the difference between these mountains and our mountains they're completely green okay vegetation covers every surface no matter how steep no matter how jagged there's plant life on it Okay, and that's because it rains so much that even the rocky surfaces okay, can support plant life. Here, you, know, you look at the mountains there, and the reason the tops are bare is because most of the year they're frozen, and there's no soil whatsoever. So it's dry. Okay? Even when that snow melts, the moisture doesn't stay there. It runs off the mountains and fills the rivers and things like that. Okay? So the mountains there, because it is so wet, can be completely covered with vegetation. If you've ever seen like a chia pet, okay? that's kind of like what these mountains are like. There's stuff literally growing all over them. All right? Does that sort of make sense? And you can see here in this valley, all right, these are quite high mountaintops here. And again, there's vegetation growing absolutely everywhere. Right? It's just that wet that anywhere can support stuff. Okay, uh, another big thing here, precipitation exceeds evaporation and transpiration. So more water falls here than can evaporate. So is that going to lead to flooding? Absolutely. Okay, now soils, okay, they tend to be uh, characterized by intense weathering. What we mean by that is they tend to wash away and erode very easily because of the amount of flooding that goes on. All right, so there's lots of flooding, and as a result, a lot of the minerals get leached away. All right, now, if you get a leech on you, what does it do? Yeah, it sucks your blood. Okay, well, water will do the same thing when it's sitting on top of soil. If it's sitting on top of dirt, the dirt below becomes saturated, and it all becomes like one big solution. And so the minerals and nutrients that are in the soil dissolve in the water that's in the soil and that is unfortunately in contact with the stuff on top. So eventually those minerals move from high concentration to low concentration and into the water that's above the soil and that's the stuff that washes away. So it literally sucks all the nutrients and minerals out of the soil and then washes it away and into the oceans okay, where it doesn't do any good for these plants. So these plants are not surviving on the nutrients in the soil. They're usually surviving on the nutrients that are in the flood water that they're submerged in the majority of the year. So these soils do tend to be kind of reddish in color. Okay? And you can see that their roots are everywhere. All right? it, they're very closely intertwined because there's just so much growth. Okay? All right. Um, decomposition is also really, really rapid. Okay? When, a, when a tree dies in the tropical rainforest, it is gone in a matter of weeks. Okay, a tree falls in the forest here. Okay, first it makes a sound, whether you believe that or not, it does. Okay, and then it decays for years. All right. I mean, if you you know go hiking in the same place year after year, a down tree can be there for like a decade before it's completely gone. Right, and that's because, well, it's frozen for at least half of the year, and so bacteria and fungus and whatever else that normally decompose things only have so long to work on it. Whereas here, it's always wet, it's always warm, and decomposition happens really, really fast. Okay. 
All right. Now, does that mean that those nutrients get right back into the cycle and back into the soils? No. Oftentimes, that stuff that gets decomposed gets washed away. So again, really nutrient poor soil, but remember, it's often covered in very nutrient rich water. All right, so the soils here, I think I showed you this picture once before when we were talking about soil profiles, but you can see here the A horizon, the top soil, is very, very thin if it's there at all. And then there's a very large B horizon, which is mostly clay. Okay? The, the roots can be anchored into that, but they're not drawing a lot of moisture or nutrients out of it because there isn't much moisture or nutrients in the B horizon. So they are surviving on that, uh, on that flood water. And then obviously there's the parent material further down that's actually quite weathered and broken. Okay, now vegetation, okay, uh, very diverse. I if you go into a forest in Canada, you might be able to identify, like if, let's say you went into Banff, you might be able to identify maybe five or six different types of spruce trees, okay? You'd have like Douglas fir, uh, Engelman spruce, black spruce, white spruce, um, lodgepole pine, okay? Really, that's about it. Right? There's maybe five different kinds of trees. And then if you considered a little bit lower down, you'd have white poplar, trembling aspen, whatever. Okay? You might have maybe on the outside eight or ten. Well, in the tropical rainforest, there aren't only millions of trees. There's like literally hundreds to thousands of different kinds of trees in that same amount of space. Right? To give you an idea, okay, there's a hundred different tree types per hectare. Now, a hectare is an area 100 meters by 100 meters, roughly the area enclosed by our running track, so about the size of a football field okay, is a hectare. There's, not just a, there's mo way more than 100 trees, obviously, but there could be up to 100 different species of tree in that same space. Right? How many different kinds of trees would you see growing in a 100 meter square area in Canada? Two, three, maybe. Right? This is just not the same diversity because there's not the same nutrient availability. Okay? Because there's so many nutrients and stuff available, okay, and so and so much rainfall and all that, lots of different things can grow there. Okay? All right. Obviously they're evergreen. They're not pine or spruce like our evergreen are. Okay? They're just they're like this. They have big leafy fronds, okay, kind of like palms and things like that, but they don't lose their leaves. If you lose your leaves in the tropical rainforest, you're dead. Right, because other things will outgrow you and shade you out. So they have to be growing all the time. Okay, this is what the rainforest looks like at ground level. Right, when you're standing at ground level, this is what you would see. Right, much different than when you're ground level in a Canadian forest where you can see quite a ways. Here, it just literally it closes off. Right, it's very dense. It's very thick. All right, and here, okay, this is a picture of another place in the rainforest. Uh, these are roots. Okay, this is actually an area that's been kind of excavated away. And so you can see all the roots that they had here, okay, in order to anchor them. When the floodwaters come, this is what holds the tree in place. But also, you see growing out of the sides of the trees, you see these weird structures? Okay, these are breathing roots. These stay above the water line so that the trees can still absorb oxygen and their roots don't suffocate. Okay. To give you some idea, I couldn't get a picture of me standing up there, but if I was standing up there, those can be seven to eight feet off the ground. Okay, so because floodwaters can be pretty deep, okay, at times, so they have to make sure that these kind of snorkel roots, okay, can can stay above the water line, and supply oxygen to the tree. Because what happens to trees around here if they get if they're submerged for very long? They die because they don't have snorkel roots. They can't absorb oxygen. Okay, they're essentially their roots just suffocate. They can't burn the sugars that they're being produced by the leaves, and they die. Okay, obviously in the rainforest they have to have adaptations to survive that. Okay, fauna. That's the things, the animals. Okay, that live in the rainforest. If you don't like bugs, don't go to the rainforest. You will not enjoy yourself. The vast majority of the animals that live in the rainforest are bugs. Okay? Lots and lots of them, and big ones too. Okay? Big, nasty, ugly bugs. Right? Like the dung beetle. And that's what it, yeah, it eats dung. Makes balls and stuff out of dung and rolls them. Have you ever seen dung beetles? Like, they just, they roll up poop into balls and move it around. It's disgusting. Okay, uh, you also have things like the walking stick. Has anyone ever seen one of these? Okay, they're actually pretty cool. Um, when I was in university, we had a, a TA, and he was an entomologist, and he would bring in all of his bugs every week. Was a different bug, and he brought in this walking stick that was literally from my arm to my from my pink 
my finger to my forearm, and you could hold it, and it would just grip on you with the little prickly things on its legs. And then he would come over, and he would blow on it, and it would sway, less, just like a leaf in the wind. Okay, it was like perfectly camouflaged. If you would have had this thing in the jungle, you'd have never seen it. Okay, but it was big. It was just a huge, ugly bug. Okay, um, you got your praying mantis. Okay, obviously uh, something you don't want to mess with. They're pretty aggressive. Okay, all kinds of of bugs, walking sticks, like we said, all kinds of things. Um, not a lot of big mammals. Okay, most of the mammals are quite small. They're mostly like rodents. The biggest one would probably be this one. Anyone know what this is? Yes, this is the three-toed sloth. It is the slowest mammal. Okay, um, but it doesn't have to be fast because there's no big predators in the rainforest either. Okay, uh, and so it can just kind of hang out on the branches of the rainforest and and eat leaves at its leisure. Okay, um, in fact, it is what we call arboreal, and most of the animals are. Why do they have to live in the trees? Right, to stay above the waters. If you are an animal that digs a hole to live in in the rainforest, you'd better be a fish. Okay, because you are not going to be able to live in that hole. It's going to be full of water all the time. All right, so the majority of the animals are arboreal. Okay, and so they, uh, they live in the trees. The, the sloth will spend its entire life, it'll never touch the ground. Because they can't move on the ground. They're so their arms and chest are so weak okay, that they can't move along the ground. If you look here, you can actually see... It's got almost like a coat hanger for a toenail, okay? And that's how it moves along. It just shimmies along the trees, the same way you would slide a coat hanger along the rack in your closet, okay? And they just slide along like that, okay? Pick something off the tree and eat it. You guys ever seen seen a sloth? Okay, they have a weird face too. Their eyes are really close together and their face is really flat. Okay, they're kind of spooky looking when you see them. Okay. All right, um, the big problem in the rainforest right now has to do with human activity. Well, oftentimes, a particular species, be it plant or animal, may only live in a very small area, meaning it's endemic, okay? May only live in a very, very small area. That's the only place in the world that species may exist. And if that area is deforested or whatever, that species is now extinct, okay? And it was found, you know, that there was a very high rate of species extinction as a result of this kind of back in the 90s. And so now people are trying to, you know, change the way people log and, and harvest uh, the rainforest in order to prevent that kind of thing from happening. Okay, and uh, chemical cycling. Eric, can I get you to just turn off that front bank of lights for me there so we can see this picture a little bit better? Okay, you can see here that there's a lots of kind of stuff growing on the ground, lots of moss, okay, things like that. Fungus and things like that would be very, uh, very, very plentiful there. Things that could break stuff down quickly when it dies, okay? And so you can see there's lots of ferns and things, right? Here's a log that's fallen down on the ground. It won't be there very long. Okay. Most of the time it's going to be you know, submerged in water, which helps it soften up and lets fungus and bacteria get a handhold in it and lets it, you know, decompose very rapidly. Okay, now, um, food chains in the rainforest are quite long and they're usually quite complex. They're not, you know, producer, consumer, blah, blah, blah. They usually are, you know, branched off and they go in different, you guys remember what a food chain is, right? Okay, all right, so uh, they're usually quite complex. The reason for that is because there's so many bugs. Right, so you'll have your plants and you'll have the animals and bugs that eat the plants, but then there's this, you know, back and forth, and sometimes, uh, you know, some things can, can be at two levels on the food chain, and they can be up or down, and, uh, and that's just, again, because there's so many bugs, and the bugs really um, move around a lot within the food chain and making them quite long, all right? So there's a long chain before you get to sort of your top carnivore, which, oddly enough, is also usually a bug. Okay, because like we said, there aren't a lot of mammals, and the mammals that do live in the rainforest are usually not carnivorous. They're usually herbivores. Right, so most of your food chains, the top carnivore is a bug, maybe a bird. Okay. All right. Okay, so the savanna. Okay, now we're talking about that tropical prairie that exists for the most part in Africa. Okay, so you're looking at the Serengeti. Okay, you'd see, you know, herds of wildebeests and and zebras and giraffes and stuff like that. Okay, and you would obviously see lots of bugs again. All right, but different kinds of bugs, not so much the tropical rainforest, you know, walking sticks and things like that, but lots and lots of termites and ants. Okay, and things like that that can live very well in a prairie hot kind of area. Right. Um, 
I forgot where I was going with that thought. Anyway, okay, 12% of the Earth's land area, okay, including lots of the areas that, like we say, fringe on the tropical rainforest. So where the tropical rainforest starts to thin is typically where you would see you know, your um, your savanna. And the savanna isn't always prairie like this. It can be woodland as well, but it's not tropical rainforest type of wooded area. It's it's more like patches of trees here and there. Okay, uh, so you can see that in both of these pictures. There's you know um, different types of trees, but you can see that their leaves are quite high above the ground and they're very flat. They have very much an umbrella shape. Okay, most of these trees. Any ideas why? They're very widespread, but not so much tall, and they make this umbrella shape. Why would they do that? Um, shade out competition a little bit, but mostly just for shade. What's underneath them? Their roots, right? Now, remember, you're going to get rain for two months and then none for another 10. So you want to keep the sun off of the soil where your roots are so that it stays moist for longer. So they typically have a canopy shape that protects and shades their roots. It also means that animals like wildebeests and zebras can't eat their leaves. They're high enough off the ground they can't get them, but what can? Giraffes, hence the evolution of the long neck okay, of the giraffe. Right? Longer neck allows them to access food items that other animals would not be able to access. Okay. All right, now climate okay, accounts for the character of these areas. Um, because they have this very definite dry season, uh, a lot of plants and animals okay, estivate, which means essentially they go dormant for, for a period of time. Okay, and you can see here on this climatogram, temperature pretty consistent, around 30 degrees Celsius okay, all, the, all year long, so around the equator. But you can see there is a definite increase in rainfall okay, through like March and April, and then, like we say, very little comparatively for the rest of the year. Okay. Um, what's this cheetah sitting on? Um, it's a termite mound. That's a mound made out of termite poop, which is really just sawdust. Okay. Uh, termites will eat any type of plant material. Okay. Um, you don't want to get termites in your house because they'll literally turn the frame of your house into sawdust and your house will collapse. We don't have any issue with it up here because it's too cold. Termites can't survive up here. Okay. But uh, in more tropical areas, they have to take uh, much greater steps to prevent infestation of termites in homes. Okay. So they build them a little differently. Their building codes are slightly different uh, to prevent that because obviously that can create big problems for the structure of your home if it starts getting eaten away okay, by bugs. And in the, tr and in, the, in the savanna, they'll go after seeds, dead leaves, living leaves, live trees, whatever. Okay? They'll go after any plant material they can get, and they eat a lot of it. All right? You imagine how small termites are. They're, they're, they look kind of like, like uh, wasp larvae or something like that. They're kind of about that long. Okay? Um, and they'll just eat and eat and eat, and then they make these big mounds out of essentially the dead plant material they've pooped out, okay? And uh, you'll see these big mounds everywhere. <laughs> Never seen that one. Okay, so yeah, they, they do. They'll eat plant material very, very quickly. Okay, now that's a big problem if you're a plant because if you're making seeds, you're investing a lot of energy in making these seeds, and a lot of them are being destroyed. Okay, so plants in the savanna make uncountable numbers of seeds when they go when they go to seed. Right, that way at least a small percentage of them have a chance at germinating and not being eaten up. Okay. All right, so vegetation, okay, a lot of the trees in the savanna are fire resistant. They have to be because with that long period of time with no rain, wildfires are very prevalent. Okay, so for, an, for example, the eucalyptus tree can be burned down literally to its trunk. Okay, all the leaves burned off, the bark singed and everything, and it'll grow back. Okay, it has a thick insulating bark that it grows that protects the sap in the phloem. All right, and keeps it liquid, keeps it from getting cooked, all right, and as a result, the tree can grow back even after being burned. All right, so it's a good adaptation to have for living in an area like that. Okay, uh, so like we said, there's lots of termites, there's lots of fire, seeds rarely survive, so plants have to produce enormous numbers of them each year. Okay, savanna trees are what we call zero fights. Okay, so they are drought tolerant. Okay, they can survive long periods of time without water. Okay. Um, 
they have deep roots and flattened crowns. We talked about that okay already. Okay, and some will shed their leaves during the dry season in order to reduce their water loss. Okay, savanna trees are often stunted compared to tropical rainforest trees. Right? There's no like canopies upon canopies there. Okay, um, and the grasses are quite tall because being a uh, tall grass again allows you to shade your roots out. Okay, and in fact, elephant grass, which is kind of like bamboo, okay, can reach heights of several meters. It's called elephant grass because elephants can walk through it and disappear. Imagine how tall that stuff must be then. <laughs> Was it elephant grass? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but again, that's that's what you have to do. If you're going to have a long period of heavy rainfall, you got to grow while the water is available and then kind of estivate, go dormant, okay, and use your height now to shade your roots, okay, during that during that dry time. Okay. Now, soils in the savanna, okay, you don't see a lot of that um a lot of really definite layering. There is still layering, but it's not as definite. You can see that it's very thick. Okay, very thick topsoil because every year it's grass. It's just like the prairie. That grass dies, new grass grows from below, okay, and as a result, you get a thick buildup of organic material as topsoil. Okay, so quite, um, quite nutrient rich. Okay, the thing to worry about is that during the monsoon season, there can be a lot of erosion. Right, because of that heavy rain, and so lots of areas will appear to have very poor soil because that would have been where the water had run previously, okay, and and sort of eroded it away. Okay, so animal life, obviously, um, it's not nearly as diverse as it is in the tropical rainforest. Right, a lot of the animals are bigger. Okay, there are insects, but there are less of them than in the tropical rainforest, and the food chains in the savanna are really short. Typically, your top carnivore eats the herbivore. Okay, so you've got grass, herbivore, lion, and a food chain. All right, so the food chains are very, very short in the savanna. Okay, everybody with me there? No one's too grossed out by the lions eating the wildebeest over there. Okay. All right. Um, now, the other thing is, is that there's lots of scavengers, okay? You've got things like hyenas and, and uh, buzzards and stuff like that, okay? That will circle the, the lion kills until the lions are gone, and then they'll come in and, and pick the bones clean, okay, of whatever is left, all right? And they're important for uh, the fact that they actually help to speed up the decomposition of whatever is remaining there, right? Because as they, they gnaw on, on the stuff that's close to the bones, they also nick the bones and they, you know... Um, make it so that water can get in there, bacteria and fungus and whatever can get in and more quickly decompose that material, okay? Uh, and so that helps to speed the decomposition. All right, like we said, termites, very abundant in their mounds, like we said, are a big feature okay, that you can see on the savanna landscape. Okay, um, this, this here picture would be probably Kenya somewhere, All right? What's this big mountain in the background? Kilimanjaro, yeah. Kilimanjaro is this big volcano that's kind of in the middle of the continent, okay? Um, and it has, it's kind of its own biome in and of itself because as you can see, it's very tall. There's snow on the top, okay, even though it's near the equator, all right? Um, so there's some of these areas that become affected by altitude a little bit, and so they're, they're slightly different structure than the rest. We don't go into that too much, but just so you know, those factors that affect climate are in effect here a little bit. Okay, chemical cycling, again, it's rapid because there's, you know, there's a fairly, fairly good amount of moisture, but there's lots of decomposing organisms, okay, and that's the really big part of it. Okay, high temperatures also help for that to happen, okay. Most nutrient loss has to do with erosion, floodwaters, as you can see here, okay. These floodwaters would quickly leach stuff out of the, uh, out of the soil and it would wash away, okay. Sudden intense storms can result in rain splash, okay, erosion of unprotected surfaces. So if you had exposed soil, those first few drops of rain that strike are so big and so heavy that they actually cause almost like a cratering effect and the and the soil will spray up into the air and be blown away okay so there's there's areas like that as well okay here you can really see that canopy effect of the trees and you can see that they have flattened crowns that would be very difficult for even a giraffe probably to reach okay being that high up all right but you can see all these animals are chilling out in the shade okay underneath all right so shade's a big factor there as well 
deserts. So, like we said, different kinds of deserts. This is your typical North American kind of Mojave type desert. Okay, um, very rocky, very poor soil. All right, and the temperature fluctuates between summer and winter because it's not equatorial. All right, and so even sometimes a desert like this may have snow. Obviously, not for very long. Okay, but it will have it for short periods. Okay, so the big thing here is that. It's almost one third of the globe is covered by what could at least be considered desert to semi-desert okay, type of biome, right? And it is obviously very dry. Okay, so climate. Looking at it here, all right. So this is uh, this is typically your hot desert. So this would be more equatorial, right? And you've got uh, your temperature here. Okay, not a huge fluctuation. Certainly not a bell curve in any in any sense. Okay, and precipitation here in millimeters. Okay. Um, no, that can't be right because that's way too uh, way too much precipitation. I'm gonna have to take that climatogram off. That can't be right. No, no, sorry. Yeah, it is. What am I thinking here? Temperature, precipitation, very, very low. Okay, wettest month. Okay, 60 millimeters of rain. That's not very much, right? That's what about that much? Okay, in one month, that's the wettest month, and the rest of the months, none, right, or pretty much none. So we're looking at uh, obviously very, very uh, dry and 32 between 24 and 32 degrees. Okay, it's certainly not uh, conditions that are ripe for a lot of growth. Okay, North American deserts typically we see a lot of cacti in the North American desert and lots of scrub like mesquite bush and stuff like that. Okay, growing in that area. Okay. Um, there is some runoff. There is a wet season in North American deserts, okay, where um, they actually get a bit of flooding, okay, snow melt from the mountains and things like that. All right, uh, so desert vegetation, short perennial grasses, thorny scrub, okay, so lots of the stuff has, lots of the things that grow in the desert have thorns. Why? Protection is one reason, sure. You don't want something coming along and chewing on you if you're trying to conserve water. Uh, to some extent, it's surface area. The, the thorns actually are the leaves okay, of a cactus. They're just modified. They don't actually carry out any, any photosynthesis anymore. All, right? all they do is keep things from chewing on the cactus itself. Because if the cactus itself gets chewed on, then that's an area where it can lose moisture from the interior. Because right? it doesn't scab over easily. So they don't want to have things chewing on them and exposing the interior to evaporation. That's why. Oh, the needles are bone dry. There's practically nothing in them. Yeah. So the, yeah, once it once it produces them, it, it's not likely to grow grow replacements. Right. Okay. Of course, it doesn't usually have to. Most things are smart enough to stay away. Yeah. Okay. Now there are exceptions. Obviously, you can see in this uh, saguaro cactus here. There's a little hole right there. Okay. There are some birds that are small enough. They get in between the thorns and they will uh, work their way inside. And actually, some of them will nest inside of the uh, saguaro cactus. Okay, um, swallow cactuses uh, are very long-lived organisms. They don't grow their first arm until they're between 80 and 100 years old. Okay, and then they grow them about every 20 years after that. So if you see a swallow cactus with lots of arms, it is very, very old. Okay, most swallow cactuses that you see are usually just a tube. Okay, and they don't have a lot of arms. So. Uh, the swallow cactus has a spreading root system. Its roots are actually right near the surface. And we talked about that in the plant unit. That's because when it does rain, it wants to be able to absorb that moisture right away. All right? it, having deep roots, unless you're going to get all the way down where you're tapping an aquifer, okay, don't do you any good in the desert. It's dry really far down. So you want shallow roots so that when it does rain, you can quickly absorb that moisture and, and kind of move on with it. Okay, there's lots of dormancy uh, as well in the desert. Okay, plants will grow kind of in their wet season and then go dormant. But you can see there's a fair amount of green even in a North American desert. Okay, plants do always find a way. All right, so typically uh, they're little weathered, so they're, there's a lot of rock, okay, is what they're saying, kind of near the surface. Okay, lacking in humus. Humus is organic material. Where do you get organic material from? dead stuff. Well, if nothing's living there, it's hard to build up any of that. Okay, so you don't get a lot of that stuff kind of building up and, and being available. Okay, uh, in lots of cases, there's no true soil at all. It's just 
you know, kind of rock. Okay, uh, there's leaching. Okay, uh, a little bit. It's it's relatively unfertile, and there's a high salinity, because oftentimes a desert forms where a body of water is dried up, and when that body of water dries up, it leaves all of the minerals that were in it right at the surface. Okay, and you see that actually around here sometimes when a slough dries up, you see that kind of white layer. Okay, called a salt flat. Okay, that stays there, and it's really hard for anything to grow in that because it's so salty, and that ruins the osmotic balance of the plants. Okay, and so they uh, they don't grow very well. Okay, now in the desert, the fauna there aren't a lot of really big animals in the desert. Camel being the notable exception. Okay, but uh, for the most part, you know your largest animals be fox and coyote. Okay. Um, they have to be quite small because there's not a lot of other things for them to eat. Okay, if, even if you're a herbivore, there's not much for you to eat. So animals typically have to be small. They also have to be able to withstand water loss. Okay, and long periods without water. Okay, so uh, you're not going to have too many animals that sweat that live in the desert because they won't survive. Right. Um, uh, the uh, desert hair, which is what you see here, you can see in its ear. You see how many, how much uh, capillaries and blood vessels it has here. That's actually to help it keep itself cool. Right? What it'll do is the same thing you do when you get flushed. Okay? If you've been working hard, your face kind of gets red. That's because blood is now in all the capillaries that are near the surface of your skin. Right? Then when you start to sweat, and that sweat evaporates, it's taking heat from the blood that's right near the surface. So your body naturally channels this blood to the surface of your skin so that the evaporation can have a greater effect in cooling you. Well. The, the hair obviously doesn't want to use sweat. So what it does is it puts the blood into its ears and then just kind of flaps its ears. Okay? And then when it flaps its ears, it can help to cool itself, All right? especially if it's in a shaded area. All right? uh, coyotes and foxes, they don't have a lot of requirements for water. Okay? They've they're got a fairly high efficiency kidney, okay? and so they don't, uh, they don't require to drink a lot. Antelope are really good for that. Okay? Antelope are actually so efficient at keeping their water, and they may never actually drink. Okay? They can actually eat cactus and get uh, almost enough moisture to live from that. Okay, so they they have a very good kidney. The the other things you'll see: uh, scorpions, tarantulas, lizards that have scaly skin, or they have like the carapace, like an insect has. They don't sweat obviously at all, and a lot of them will actually just be nocturnal, and they'll just come out at night when it's cooler. Okay, so there's an adaptation for that too. But animals that live in the desert obviously have to be very highly adaptable. Okay, so chemical cycles, soil erosion is the key loss of nutrients from the desert. There's virtually no chemical cycling in the desert because of the absence of water. Right? Without water, there's no bacteria, there's no fungus, there's no decomposition. Okay, uh, so you can see there, deserts can vary quite widely in their appearance. Okay, you've got your North American desert. Okay, you've got kind of your dry, rocky desert. You've got your shifting sands desert. Okay, they're similar properties, but they can look a lot different. Sam's Okay, temperate grasslands, so the prairies. So this is our biome. We should be quite familiar with it. Now, what do you see here in this picture? Cactus. Does cactus grow in the prairie? Sure it does. This is prickly pear. Okay, prickly pear cactus. See a lot of it down by Lethbridge Medicine Hat. That's actually where I took this picture. Okay, it was just north of Medicine Hat. Um, there's lots of that there because it's short grass prairie. It's the driest kind of prairie there is. It's you would often see it growing on the edge of a true desert. Okay, is is this short grass type of prairie? All right. Um, obviously, a short growing season for anything that grows there, but it's good for for uh, farming because you get lots of sunshine. Kind of a you know, um, you got good soils there for things like that. Especially if, especially down in that area, there's irrigation. All right. A lot of the farmers down there will actually have irrigation systems that will water their crops for them. Something we don't do up here, but if you go down there and you fly over it in a plane, you can see oftentimes that there's circles. Okay? Instead of being square plots, everything is a circle because the irrigation has a pivot in the middle and it just pivots around where the water comes out and it goes around so it only waters in a circle. You see these crops growing in circles. Okay? Now, 7% of the Earth's total land surface is, is this and that's where we grow all of our food. Okay, I shouldn't say all, but the vast majority of our food is grown on that 7%. Okay, so it's a very important 7%. Okay, so grasslands experience significant soil moisture deficit due to a long period of drought in late summer and early autumn. Right? I mean, we know that here 
the rains come in kind of June, July, and then August is much drier. September and October are pretty dry as well. Okay, but uh, if you go down, you know, down a little further south, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, that dry season usually starts kind of in July, okay, and and it gets hotter down there, obviously. Okay, and again, this was taken just north of Medicine Hat. Very short grass. Right, and that's because it is so dry for such a long period of time. Okay, your typical climatograph for a prairie. So this is Calgary. Okay, and you see obviously the bell curve because we're quite a ways from the equator. Okay, summer months are the hottest months, and you can see that June is our wettest month typically by quite a ways. Okay, May, June, or sorry, May, July, and August tend to be you know kind of a little bit less wet, but wetter, and then obviously it tapers off quite a bit in the winter. Now a lot of times people look at that and go, we get all this snow. I mean look outside, look how much snow we have. You gotta remember that snow is not nearly as much water as rain is. Okay? You get 10 centimeters of snow, you probably had a centimeter of rain as an equivalent. All right? Because snow is so much air, right? When it piles up, there's lots of air spaces in the snow. When it actually melts, if you melted 10 centimeters of snow, you would get about the same amount of moisture as 10 as one centimeter of rain. Right, so it looks like we're getting lots, but in actuality, it's not that much moisture. Okay. All right. So compared to savanna regions, okay, conditions are often less favorable for plant growth because of these cold winter times. Okay, that obviously curtail the growth. In a savanna, things can almost grow all year long, but obviously in the prairie, they can't. They're frozen for six months. Okay. All right. Now the two different kinds of prairie. Here's your short grass prairie. Okay. And this is your long grass prairie. So this would be central Alberta, Red Deer, up to maybe like St. Paul kind of an area, where you see different species of grass, much taller. Right? They get more moisture, cooler temperatures, so they don't get baked nearly as bad as the short grass prairie areas do. Okay? So you get different types of vegetation, and you'll often get uh, stands of trees intermixed within the prairie, whereas in the short grass prairie, you almost never see any stands of trees. Okay? It's just too dry for too long of a period. Okay. All right, and like we said, thick soil. Okay, thick A horizon. That's because again, every year the grasses die and they get decomposed, and new grass grows from there. Okay, so we build up this thick A horizon in those soils. Okay, uh, now the big thing with the fauna is that on the prairie, the animals that naturally lived on the prairie don't live there anymore. All right, if you were standing where we are right now, let's say 300 years ago. You would you would see a lot different structure than there is now, right? Not just with plants, but also with animals. What animal would have been present 300 years ago that you almost never see now? Bison, yeah, bison and buffalo. Okay, huge because they were killed off. All right, um, they they were very desirable for for meat. Okay, but the other thing was is that they weren't good for domesticating. So you've got your choice between trying to keep buffalo penned up and fed or cattle penned up and fed. Which do you choose? Cattle. You ever looked a cow in the eye? They're big and stupid. Okay? No, really, they are. Okay? Like you look them in the eye, there's just nothing there. All right? But a buffalo, okay, buffalo are a naturally meandering animal. All right? They would, in packs of like thousands, move throughout the province, right? And they would literally leave a manicured surface behind them, right? They would chew the grass right down to the ground, okay? And then move on. Well, as soon as you fenced them up, they'd starve, okay? They just, they, they, they had to be able to move. That was part of their sort of natural tendency. So they were not good for domesticating, okay? And they're also much bigger and stronger and smarter than cattle, and they would break through fences. Right, so they were almost impossible to keep anywhere. So you can't keep the competitor of the animal you want around. Right? So they're effectively eliminated because of that. All right. um, pronghorn, you don't see as much of them anymore either. And all of the, uh, the carnivores have been essentially eliminated as well. They're kind of inconvenient when you're trying to keep large herds of food around. Okay, chickens, cattle, whatever. Okay? You don't want coyotes, wolves, and bears hanging around the food you're trying to sell to people. Right? So they were also effectively eliminated okay, by humans off of there. So that's why this is a picture of nothing. Okay? There are no animals in this picture because pretty much all the naturally occurring animals are gone. Now, on that note, some of the animals that are naturally occurring have survived and they have taken over. Okay? Coyotes, for example. 
Okay, coyotes have remained around because they're smaller. Okay, and they're better scavengers and things like that, so they've remained around. Okay, uh, deer typically have done still pretty well. Okay, but the sort of larger ones haven't. Bears are gone. Okay, both kinds of bears used to live on the prairies and they're gone. Okay, wolves gone. Okay, all of those because they were too much of a threat. Okay, so chemical cycles, okay, productivity of the prairies is pretty high. We can get lots of grass growing on the prairies, lots of stuff there to feed um, feed people with, animals with, etc. Okay, um, cycling of nutrients is mostly between grass and the soil, so grass dies and is decomposed. Here's the problem. If we're using that area for farming, what are we taking off all the time? Every year, what do you do when you're farming? Do you leave the stuff that was growing there to decompose, or do you take it away? You take it away, right? Like you cut it off. You grow this crop. You don't leave it there and let it die and decompose. What was the point of seeding it? Okay, you, you harvest it off. So the nutrients that were in the soil are being taken away, and they're not being allowed to go back into the natural cycle of things. So you have to compensate for that with what? Fertilizer, right? Okay, now that can you know become kind of a self-perpetuating cycle if you're not careful well I you know I had to fertilize because I used all the nutrients up and now I got to fertilize even more okay there are ways to sort of limit how much fertilizer a person has to use okay you can cycle your crops you can grow one thing on a on a piece of land one year and then the next year you can grow something that puts more nutrients back in the soil on that area okay you can use the honey wagon okay you guys know what I mean crap spreader Ever seen those dump trucks with the big wheel on the back that spray the f manure everywhere? Yeah. Okay. What's that? Well, actually, the the manure spreader tends to work vertically. Is the well, I don't just, but yeah, it's the same idea, right? It's spraying it everywhere. Okay. Uh, and that also helps to obviously return some nutrients to the soil. Okay. Things like that. It doesn't always have to be an artificial fertilizer. Okay. We try and use more of the the uh, natural stuff when we can. Okay. Uh, cycling your crops is another big one. Uh, if you grow something that's really nutrient intensive, like canola, okay, the next year you typically try and grow something like beans or peas that typically put a lot of nitrogen back in the soil, okay, while they grow. So uh, that kind of stuff can help to do that too. Okay, uh, so the deciduous forest here. So this is a forest that loses its leaves every year, okay. Um, so obviously there are times of the year where not a lot of sunlight reaches the ground and there's times of the year where a lot of the sunlight reaches the ground, but usually in those times of the year, the ground's also covered with what? Snow, because it's usually winter. Okay, so 9% of the world's land surface, that may be an exaggeration because a lot of that's been deforested, like, you know, most of Europe. Okay, um, here's your typical deciduous forest climatogram. And you can see it's got a bell curve, but what do you notice about the rainfall? Yeah, it's not n it's not like the prairies where it was, you know, a couple of months. Here it's pretty level. I mean, yes, there's still a little more rain in July than in the other months, but there's no really low months either. Okay? And that's how you get a, a forest to grow in an area. You have to have consistent rainfall for forests to grow because they can't tolerate long periods of drought. Grass can, but forests can't. All right? And so typically, that's the shape you will get okay, for your um, deciduous forest. And when you're looking at climatograms, if you see a bell curve and a flat line, chances are, or sorry, sorry, a bell curve and flat bars, you're probably looking at a deciduous forest. Okay? Whereas if you see a bell curve and an obviously similar shape in the bars, okay, you're probably looking at okay, uh, your, your prairie. The thing to watch for is where those bell curves happen. Are they high or low? Okay? And you can see here that the bell curve for the temperature, okay, the lowest temperature isn't even below freezing. Okay, so these are quite temperate okay, kind of areas, whereas for the prairie, that would be shifted considerably lower. All right, so vegetation, they're typically dominated by things like oak, beech, hickory, maple, all right, uh, birch, case, you know, stuff like that. All right, uh, obviously in Canada, a lot of maple. Right? That's why we have so much maple syrup okay? and, and so much maple flavoring and things because it's readily available here. Okay? Um, the uh, sclerophyllous forest biome, okay, as you see up here, that's also what we call that Mediterranean climate. It is kind of a deciduous forest climate, so I've actually just combined it in here. Okay? This is more what, uh, what that would kind of look like. It's a different type of tree and a different kind of undergrowth. It's not nearly as thick, right? and so there's a lot more of the light penetration to the bottom and less growth near the bottom. Okay. 
Uh, competition for light okay, is a big factor here, which is why you see the trees grow up but also out to try and shade out their competition. Okay, uh, soil, you don't have to worry about luvisolic, that's not a word you need to know, okay, but they do have a good A horizon because you get a lot of that leaf litter, okay. The only problem with the leaf litter is there's so much of it and when it gets wet it can actually form like a ceiling layer on top of the soil and that can reduce the amount of oxygen that penetrates down below and that can sometimes in some cases slow the decomposition because the bacteria require the oxygen to survive okay but most of the time you get a pretty good a horizon okay with a layer of leaf litter kind of on the top of it okay is decomposition going to be as fast in this kind of forest as it is in the tropical rainforest okay why not it gets cold, right? Okay, the the winter is what kind of curtails all of that decomposing activity. Okay, uh, for the uh, food chains for the animals and stuff. Okay, obviously you're going to have bigger herbivores and bigger carnivores. Okay, um, here's something that's kind of in danger. You don't see it very often. A lynx. Okay, um, they've got really they're cats with gigantic feet. If you've ever seen one, uh, the lynx have big feet because it allows them to actually walk on top of the snow rather than sink into it. Okay, it spreads their weight out over a larger area. All right. um, owls, lots of birds within these food chains as well. Okay, some arboreal animals as well as some subterranean animals. Okay, because it's not flooded. All right, and so uh, again, insects, caterpillars, and beetles and ants and stuff like that. So it's very diverse in terms of fauna for a non-equatorial climate. Okay. Samson, you had a question. The, no, yeah, the paws. Yeah, it's 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 strange to watch them walk. They look very heavy when they walk, but they're quite nimble. Yeah. All right, and chemical cycling. I, I mean, it's quicker than most of the non-equatorial biomes. Okay, just because you know it can hold moisture in with that layer of of leaves on the top, and it does tend to be more temperate. Okay, but it isn't nearly like a tropical climate. All right, the taiga or boreal forest. We often we tend to call it more often than not in Canada the boreal forest. Okay, uh, so the boreal forest, okay, has all of these. It I means typically looks like this, right? It's a carpet of spruce trees, right? When you go to Banff, or whatever, and you're in a kind of a high point, you look down and you see nothing but that carpet of trees for as far as the eye can see. Okay, that's your typical taiga structure. Okay, the type of trees that are there are dependent on temperature and altitude. Okay, the higher up you go, different species will grow. Lower down, you might get some deciduous stuff, some lodgepole pine. A little further up, you're going to look at like, um, you know, Engelmann spruce, and then maybe Douglas fir, and then you know, black spruce, and and beyond that, just not much. Okay, um, above the tree line, we don't really consider that to be taiga anymore. So this part down here, okay, this mountainside here maybe would be taiga, but up here, that's not. Okay, that's actually a biome in and of itself. That's the top of the mountains. It would either be tundra or extreme desert, depending on whether there was grass or not. Okay, now, um, there's not a lot of moisture in this, in this climate, okay, because the snow is the typical, is kind of the main source of precipitation, but you can't pull moisture out of snow, and when it melts, it very quickly runs off. So wildfires, forest fires can be a big problem in this type of biome because it does get pretty dry through the summer months. Okay. Now, it's also relatively undisturbed until kind of more recently because for the most part it was hard to get to. There wasn't a lot of reason to get to it other than it was pretty. Okay, But now, what have we discovered at least in the more northern Tega? What's that? Um, to some extent, lumber, lumber and forestry, but even more so like Fort McMurray. Oil sand, yeah. The tar these typically tend to grow on top of tar sand and oil sand type of deposits. Okay, um, and if you want to get at that stuff, you have to bulldoze everything that's on it. All right. So if you've ever seen the uh, oil sands operation, they essentially line bulldozers up side by side, push everything over, push it out of the way, and then they start mining it. Right. They come in with the big trucks. Okay. If you ever seen those big Komatsu trucks, like if you stand next to one of them next to the tire, you come about halfway up. Okay, they're huge, all right, and they've got these big dredges that just kind of shovel a whole bunch of the the tar sand into the back of these, and then it gets heated up and separated. Okay, but 
that's kind of the main source of disturbance for these now, in addition to obviously forestry. Okay, um, so typically to maximize the the sort of output of the area, they push all that stuff over, send it all to the forestry area, and then they do the uh, the oil sand stuff, and then they put all the stuff back and replant. Okay, so I'm not saying the I'm not saying the oil companies destroy everything and leave it destroyed. They do actually put everything back. Okay, once they're all finished. But I mean, it takes a while for all that to to grow and reestablish, whatever. Okay, uh, climate. Some of the coldest temperatures on Earth in the Tega, minus 45 to minus 50, and it can stay there for long periods of time. Okay, typical climatogram for the Tega. You can see that the precipitation is relatively uniform, but very low. All right, and you also notice there is a bell curve, but look where the bell curve peaks. Okay, warmest temperature 15 degrees, whereas your lowest temperatures, you know, are down minus 25, minus 30. Okay, very, very cold. All right, so you know when you're looking at a climatogram on a test and you're seeing a bell curve with not a lot of precipitation, okay, you're probably looking at either Tega or Tundra. Okay, everyone, follow me there. It's probably Tega if you've got you know, a few months that are above zero. If it's tundra, it'll probably be a, f you know, a couple more months that are below zero and a little bit less precipitation. Okay, right. vegetation, like we said, not very diverse, mostly spruce trees of different species. Okay, obviously there is some undergrowth, but not a lot because, again, there's not a lot of moisture underneath. There's not a lot of sunlight penetration through all the spruce. Okay, so there's not a lot of undergrowth. Okay, and soils tend to be poorly developed. Okay, uh, parent material can be quite close to the surface in some places, and because it's frozen a lot of the a lot of the year, it doesn't get a chance to build up a lot. Plus, spruce trees typically don't give a lot of litter either. Right, they're not you know giving like what grass does or what deciduous trees do. Needles don't necessarily represent a lot of nutrient material. Okay, um, animals are very adaptable here. Uh, some very unique types of organisms that live there. And a lot of them will take advantage of the insulative properties of snow. How many people have ever built a Quincy before? Okay, so Quincy is like an emergency snow shelter, right? You just throw snow into a big pile and then hollow out the pile. All right, and you can crawl inside and you can get the temperature in there actually up to close to freezing, sometimes even above. Sometimes it'll start to drip on you a little bit, okay, because snow is such a good insulator. And you can see here that this little uh, mole or whatever it is, okay, he's got his burrow underneath this low density powdery type of snow. So it's minus 40 above the snow. But as you go down the layers, okay, he's actually got it to plus 10 degrees inside his burrow because there's so much snow insulating him from the outside. Now here's the problem. If anything compacts that snow, it loses all of its insulative value. Because the insulative value of that snow comes from the fact that it prevents convection from occurring. Okay, convection requires air to be able to move, right? Hot air to descend and cold air, or sorry, cold air to descend and hot air to rise. But if all that air is trapped between the flakes of snow that make up this pile, that can't happen. And that's how fiberglass insulation works in your house, okay? You guys have all seen that stuff, right? The pink stuff that's in your walls, okay? Same idea. The air can't move within there, so the cold air outside can't make a current that will interact with the warm air on the inside of the wall. Okay, making sense? Um, okay, we got animals that will hibernate okay, throughout the year, some of which will reduce their metabolism down to practically nothing. Right? Squirrels and gophers are uh, some of the best organisms at this. If you were to pick up that squirrel there, you would think it was dead. Right? It would be cold and stiff, but it's alive. Okay? In the wintertime, they curl up into this ball and they'll lower their metabolism down so they're breathing like once every couple of minutes. Their heart beats only a few times per minute. Okay? They're in essentially a coma almost, all right? where their body temperature drops down to you know, like 10 degrees, 5 degrees Celsius. They're very, very cold. Okay? And they'll wake up once in a while throughout the winter, shiver for about a half an hour until their body temperature gets up to something where they can walk around. They'll eat some of the seeds that they've stored over the summer, and then they'll go back into that state again. Okay? So that's what a true hibernator does. Their metabolism lowers, okay? and, and, they're, and they use a lot less fuel. A bear is not a true hibernator. They'll spend a lot of time of the winter sleeping, okay? but they don't reduce their metabolism. 
right? So they actually burn off a lot of their fat during the winter, whereas these will burn some fat but also eat some food stores. Okay, anybody seen one of these before? No one knows what that is? That's a wolverine. Okay, they're very rare. You don't see them often, and you'd be fortunate if you didn't see one. If you imagine a grizzly bear concentrated down into something about the size of a German shepherd, okay? So take all the anger and aggression of a grizzly bear and put it in something smaller, all right? That's what a wolverine is, okay? They are a carnivorous animal, okay? They have very big, long teeth, nice, long, sharp claws, okay? And uh, are quite vicious if you make them angry, all right? So, um, but like I said, they're pretty rare. They were very desirable for their pelts for quite a while, okay? And that's why they're so endangered. Um, and then obviously there's bigger animals obviously that live in the taiga, grizzly bears, black bears, okay, things like that. You got your elk and your caribou that also live in there. So a lot of the animals are big, right? You, you see some rodents, but a lot of the animals are quite big herds, herds of herbivores as well, okay? Uh, and we talked about this back in the biology in a little bit, okay? Changes in light patterns, okay, are what cues hibernation, mating seasons, food storage, eating, okay, things like that, okay. Bears tend to be most aggressive and, and hung, you know, and, and sort of eating the most near late summer, early autumn, because that's when they have to put on their fat, okay, and get ready for the winter time, right, and that's because the days are getting shorter. They sense the days are getting shorter, so that's when they're, you know, they eat the most, and that's when you have to be the most mindful of them. Okay, now, um, what do grizzly bears eat? Yeah, uh, actually surprisingly, I mean, we consider them to be this incredible carnivore, which they can be if the food sources are available. But around here, they eat berries and tons of them, all right? which is why bear scat has a very typical appearance to it. All right? It's like very runny. All right? um, and that's because they'll just take bushes and put them in between their teeth and just pull them through and strip all the leaves and berries off, okay, and then eat all the leaves and berries, okay. Um, in fact, a lot of times you'll find bear scat that just has berries in it, like they're not even digested uh, completely. I actually saw a thing where this uh, survival expert was actually p picking the berries out of the scat and eating them. I don't recommend doing that because I think that was stupid, okay. It was a perfectly good way to get like E. coli or something, but all right, uh, maybe wash them off or something. Or go find some berries to eat instead of eating the ones somebody's already eaten. Okay, um, but yeah, apparently you can do that, but I wouldn't. All right, um, chemical cycling, like we say, it's going to be slow. Okay, chemical cycling has to be slow in this biome because it's cold for so much of the year and it's dry as well. Not conditions favorable to the growth of fungus and bacteria and things like that that would decompose things. Right? A lot of the decomposition has to do with the freeze and thaw cycle. When liquid water gets inside like a rotten log and freezes, it can split it and get it into smaller pieces. But again, that's a very slow process. So it takes a long time for trees and things like that that have died to decompose. Okay. Okay, uh, the tundra biome, okay, you can see here, okay, there's lots of, of just grasses and, and mosses and things like that, okay. Look at here, this is July 6th. What's this? Snow, okay. July 6th, and there's still like huge chunks of snow, okay, sitting around in this biome. There, there can be snow cover 12 months of the year in the tundra, okay, at least partial snow cover. Uh, and snow cover is important for plants through the winter months because it actually protects them from the intense cold of the winter, okay. It also protects them from the abrasive properties of blowing snow, all right. If you've got like crystals of snow or ice and they're blowing at high speed, it can be like standing in front of a sandblaster, all right. It can literally just peel the flesh right off. And so plants want to have snow cover to be protected from all of that. So snow cover is really important for them, okay. Mountain tundra has an additional survival problem in that thin air can result in higher levels of exposure to ultraviolet radiation, okay. Plants can get a sunburn too, right. So they have to be kind of mindful of that. Not that they can put on sunscreen, but they have to grow thicker cuticles and things like that to protect the fleshy parts. All right. Uh, so if you're looking at a, uh, a climatogram of a, uh, of a tundra biome, okay, you can see here we've only got four months where the temperature is above zero. Okay, and precipitation, okay, the wettest month is 62 millimeters of rain. Okay, so again, 
Looking about that much rain. That's the wettest month. Okay, rest of the year, okay, is fairly even, other than these points here, right? But low. All right, I know this climatogram doesn't make it look low, but you got to remember the scale over here. Okay, the highest number on here is 70 millimeters. Well, the desert is that, right? But we can't show a negative value. We can only show how much is actually measured on the ground. Okay, so um, plants have to be able to carry out their life cycle really quickly in the tundra because they're only going to have three months tops to do it. Now, what's the benefit if you're a plant in the tundra for those three months? What do you have a lot of? Well, one, it is a resource, but I'm thinking of one in particular, the most important one for a plant. Sunlight. Remember, in the Arctic, for three months, it's going to be light almost 24 hours a day. Okay, so yes, they only have three months to grow, but remember, during those three months, they're getting between 18 and 24 hours of sunshine every day. So they do have a lot of energy coming in to help them do that. Right? Otherwise, it would be next to impossible for anything to survive. All right, again, so vegetation here, you can see here, again, this is one taken in July, and there's still snow cover in a lot of places, significant snow cover in a lot of places. But that also means you're not getting any large vegetation growing. It's all going to be kind of grasses and mosses and things like that. Okay, we were talking about snow cover, okay, extremely important, okay, because it protects the plants from winds and ice abrasions, okay. And what happened to my... Last one here. Do you guys have the extreme desert one on yours? Pretty sure I put it in there. What's that? Someone got the notes package there. Flip it over. Huh. Okay. I didn't have the. I know I have a slide with it somewhere here. Okay. Um, your heat transfer stuff. Just want to quickly talk about that here for a sec. While we have a minute. Okay. What were the three methods of heat transfer? Convection is one. Okay. Conduction and radiation. Right. Now, let's say practical application type stuff of heat transfer here. Okay, I told you that normally we do a little kind of lab thing where you build yourself something that would use solar energy to, uh, to heat up some water. Okay, if I want to, let's say, insulate something. Okay, we talked about this a little bit, how snow is an insulator, how you know, fiberglass insulation keeps heat in. Okay, um, how, we talked about how those prevented convection. Okay, so let's say within your wall, You've got your your fiberglass insulation, which is essentially just a snarl of little strings of glass. Okay, what's trapped in between all of those little fibers? Air, right? Air is trapped within there. All right, you don't want to allow fiberglass insulation to get compacted. Okay, that's why it comes typically in a bag that's almost like pressurized, almost inflated. When you open it, air often comes out. Okay, because we want it to be as full as possible, as fluffy as possible. That's why oftentimes if a bird gets wet, okay, the first thing they do is, is shake really hard, so that, and a dog too, okay, they'll shake really hard to get the, the water off, but also to fluff up their feathers or fur, because in doing so, they've got more air trapped within the feathers, fur, okay, whatever it is, and that keeps them warmer, all right? That's why uh, ducks typically and, and geese have that layer of down underneath their feathers. Right? Typically, we use that in, in like expensive parkas and, and jackets and sleeping bags and stuff because it traps so much air, and it even works wet. Okay? Fiberglass, not so good wet. Cotton, not very good wet because what happens in between all the fibers when they get wet? Yeah, they stay wet. The water gets in the holes instead of air. The water actually forces the air out. But in down and things like that, they work. Uh, they still work even if they're a bit wet. But cotton doesn't. All right. So these prevent convection by not allowing air to move. Okay. Now, what if I want to prevent heat transfer by conduction? Conduction, remember, is particles running into each other. Okay. So if I've got something that's dense and the particles are close together, can they conduct heat very well? Okay. So how do I prevent conduction from allowing heat to get out of something. Okay, well, insulation will 
to some extent do that, but remember, there's pieces of this glass that are in contact with both sides of your wall. Okay, now glass is not a very good conductor of heat, that's why we use fiberglass for insulation. Okay, but if it's transfer by contact, can I eliminate points of contact? Yeah, and that's what we typically try and do. Okay, that's why the frame of your house is built with the skinny side of the of the boards facing in out, as opposed to the wide side of the boards facing in out. It okay it creates a big barrier between the outside and the inside, so we can put more insulation in there, and there's less contact points between inside and outside. Everybody follow? Okay, if you've ever seen how like a, a real thermos type of thing is built, okay, um, inside of any typical thermos thing is a is a vacuum layer. All right, so like on the inside of this coffee mug, there's a, a layer of aluminum, and then there's a vacuum, and then there's this outer layer of, of aluminum or whatever it is on the outside. So there's no air, there's nothing in between the inside and the outside of this. All right, the only point of contact is up here where the lid is. Okay, and I can feel right now that down here it's cold, even though the coffee inside is still hot. The only place it's warm is just around here at the top, where there is a point of contact and there's a little bit of conduction occurring. Okay, everybody follow me on that? Okay, having a vacuum, does that prevent essentially all kinds of heat transfer? Well, it certainly prevents convection, because if there's nothing in there, you can't get anything moving. And it prevents conduction, because there's no contact. But does it prevent radiation? No, radiation can travel through a vacuum. That's how it gets here from the sun. All right, but what can I do to radiation that might keep it inside? What's that? Uh, no, I don't need to put anything thick or heavy. I don't want to use lead and something I'm going to drink out of, right? Can I reflect it? Okay, isn't that what the greenhouse effect does, right? It reflects that radiant energy back to us, right? So what color would be best for that? White, okay? And that's why typically the inside of, of you know, mugs that do a good job are either kind of brushed chrome, okay, or white. They'll reflect the radiant energy of whatever's inside back inside. All right. Is that sort of making sense? All right. So those are kind of a practical application of those heat transfer methods. You might want to listen to the last five minutes of this podcast when you're studying because I have a question on the unit exam about that. Yes, just like the one on your review. So it'll help you with that one on your review too. That's just like the one that's on the test. Okay, so tomorrow, right, we're going to do the usual unit exam review stuff. You already have the sheet because I gave that, or sorry, no, I will give you the re exam review sheet tomorrow. I gave you the final exam review sheet on uh, Friday. If you weren't here Friday, make sure you pick up yours out of the box. Okay, questions on any of that stuff? Okay, you got a little bit of time then to look over that final exam review sheet here before the bell goes.